Okay, so we're going to begin. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for all that you do and for the Sabbath uh, that's coming for us here and for the blessings of this week. We ask, Lord, that we can enter into your rest and that the, the time that we have together on the Sabbath will have a double blessing. We know we have faced trials, and many people have faced trials this week, um, but we just ask for your peace. Be with us in this study as we look at the birth of Samson and the meaning to us here at the end of the world. We invite your spirit to instruct us and to bring Christ's presence near to us. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone. Now, uh, this study, this is study number 10, the birth of Samson. Now, the line of Samson, because it contains so many chapters, uh, that is 13, 14, 15, and 16, four chapters, and lots of narrative. So unlike Ibzan, Elan, and Abdin, or Tola and Jair, uh, we have a lot to go on. And that means we have lots of symbols, and we have to sort through these lines. And we spent a lot of time on Samson. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many months, but he was by far the longest uh, that we spent of any of the judges. And he's the one I'm the least confident in. Um, that I am the most uncertain about is how to sort through his lines. Now, parts of it I'm, I'm quite certain about, and I'm very familiar with the symbols in Samson. Um, and what I'm going to do uh, tonight is we're going to go through the birth of Samson. So we have created a line called the line of Manoah. I'm going to give you some background on this and how we have uh, created this line what we've struggled with, and, um, and then after this one, I'm going to start on the week of Christ, which I'm going to do for the Sabbath sermon and also the last presentation on Saturday night, <clears throat> Sabbath evening. Um, and so I have this study um, and then uh, two more studies. So I actually have on Samson itself, I, I have um, a study tomorrow evening, at 5.45, Mountain Daylight Time. And then we have, on Sunday, I have an unfinished line of Samson, um, which is kind of where we left off in our studies of understanding the lines. It's basically the last thing that we had done. And what we, what we want to be able to do, it would be nice if, you know, uh, for that last study, there's more participation. I know it's going to be um, you know, 12.45 p.m. I know that people in other parts of the world can be live with that one. Um, but I would like to have discussion with that study on Sunday Sunday afternoon. It's in, in 12.45 here. <clears throat> so one of the problems that we faced with Samson is that Samson is a type of Christ. This is well attested by all kinds of commentators, all kinds of Christians. But there's a problem with that. So the big problem with Samson is he is not really very moral. He's immoral in lots of ways. But yet, he's God's chosen deliverer. And so we can see these parallels. Even though he's morally ironic, he parallels Christ in his miraculous birth, which is announced by an angel, as well as his role as the deliverer of God's people. He is betrayed and mocked. Uh, a temple is damaged when he dies. So the temple of the veil is ripped in twain from top to bottom. When he dies, it's, it's a pagan temple. And there's all kinds of parallels. The Nazarite connection is one. But we have this moral character of Samson. It is unchristlike. And 
when we, we looked at this, we couldn't just take the whole narrative and flip it over, right? I mean, we couldn't just say, well, everything is ironic because it's only the moral aspects that are ironic. The story itself, in a, in a sense, is straightforward. We also have lots of different lines, as I said, and we have a line of Manoah. We have the story of Manoah that's full of many details and symbols, which we have worked out on a line, and that's what we're going to look, out, look at. Now, we believe this is a zoom into Samson's birth um, and the time of the end on the big line of Samson. So when we have the big line of Samson, you have, of course, the first angel arriving, that time of the end. That's where the birth of Samson obviously is going to be a zoom into that history. And so that's what we want to look at. Now, um, we learn about this uh, oppression of the Philistines. So Stephen has shown that um, Samson's existing and, and ministering in this 40 years that's talked about. And there's other judges that are in that period. So we're going to have Eli in that period, right? Um, and we're going to have uh, some of those other j judges there, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. They're in that 40 years. They, they overlap that. Um, but this, it says in verse 1 of chapter 13, the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. Now, so I, I put in the notes, there's questions about how we place this, how we place this with the other judges. Um, but we have, we have chosen uh, to put Samson in that same 40-year period that starts with the Philistines and the Ammonite oppression. Right? So it's, it's part of the same period. <clears throat> and um, so that 18 years in Judges 10.8... And the 40 years in Judges 13, verse 1, we have them start at the same time, right? That's the idea, the 18 years and the 30 years. That's what I put in my notes. I'm glad I'm correct. Um, now, it says there was a certain man of Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. So we can see this parallel, and in uh, the margin of my Bible, it brings us to Luke chapter 1, verse 11 and 13. So we know that this is going to tell us about the story of, if we look there, let's go there, Luke chapter 1, I don't want to make an assumption here, so this is actually going to refer, I was thinking that this is what this refers to. This is going to refer to Zechariah and um, dealing with the birth of John, right? So they're not taking it and putting it with the, uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. So uh, that's going to be Zechariah or Zacharias in the King James, right? But they reference that, um, that story. And... A part of this is we know that John the Baptist has this Nazarite connection as well, right? Just like Samson does. So there's a connection there of what he's supposed to eat, instructions about how, um, you know, what kind of food he's going to eat. So we know that with John the Baptist, he's going to be a vegetarian and he's not going to be, uh, he's going to basically take a Nazarite vow. So there's that connection as well. Um, in verse 4, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Right, so here we have this announcement, this annunciation, whatever it is, that parallels uh, the story of John the Baptist and, and other stories, but also the story of Christ. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me, and his countenance 
was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. Now, why would she mention this? So the wife of Manoah, she, she says he's like, his countenance was like an angel of God, right? So it wasn't just some guy he met she, or she met. It was an angel of God. That's what she says. But she didn't ask where he came from and he didn't tell me his name. But he told me, She's go- you're going to conceive, bear a son, and now no drink, nor wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing. Um, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. So again, we have this uh, instruction repeated. And she's telling this to her husband, right? So we have an angel of the Lord come to this woman, and then she's going to go to her husband. So what do they represent? Manoah and Manoah's wife. Okay, church and state. Okay. Um, So why does the message go first to the woman and not to Manoah? Okay, judgment begins with the house of God. But this message needs to be given from the church to the world, Mm -hmm. right? So, so we can see there's an illustration there of the giving of the gospel. We can see how this parallels um, the Jews, right? In a sense, we could, we could make an application of this story uh, to the time of Christ that a message is going to come to the Jews and the Jews share that message with the world, right? We, we could take it that way. Now, Manoah, he's going to entreat the Lord. So in verse 8, Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said unto him, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? And how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I have commanded her, all that I have commanded her, let her observe. So, you know, again, here, she comes to the woman, but then the woman finds the husband. She brings the husband, and the husband comes to this angel of the Lord. He's... He sees that he's a man of God, but it's an angel of the Lord, right? That's the narrative tells us that. And then Manoah says unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. But if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? And when, and when, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Right? So we know that this Pali, this is part of the Palamoni, right? The, it's the word wonderful. Right? So we've studied this. We should be familiar with it. And, but the thing is, if we are applying this story, as we, we are, have been making an application from 2001 to 2023, and when we look at Samson and we put him on the lines uh, that we have of the judges, right? so we have a line of the judges, and in that line of the judges, Samson is January 11th, 2023. That's the way, Mark, we chose. He is the third angel arriving. 
Now we're zooming into that line of Samson. So we have the line of Samson itself. And then we're zooming into the first way mark on that line. So we're, we're, we're touching on that line of January 11th, 2023. But it's the beginning of it. So it's going to reach back farther uh, than we would if we were looking at the last way mark in the line of Samson. If we are zooming into the last way mark, we would be looking farther ahead. But in this line, the line of Manoah, we're zooming into the arrival of the first message. So we're, we're going to end up with the line of Manoah starting all the way back at November 9th, 1989. It's going it's to bring us there to that history. <clears throat> so this, this key here of the name being secret, we know it relates to Palmoni. So we know it relates to the information regarding the symbolic use of numbers in this movement. Now, again, we're making this application to our time because we've been directed that way. We're not saying that that is the application of the book of Judges because we can apply it to the time of Christ as a type, right? He's, if he's a type of, the, of Christ, then we can make an application of the story of Samson to the time of Christ. And we could take this story and make applications different places. But since at the end of the world... The prophets speak more for our time than for their own time. We know that we can make this application. Now, it still may have a future application that doesn't apply directly to this movement at this time. But this is the application we're taking of the story of Samson. And, and in this story, we can see that the issue here has to do with our characters because Samson is a type of Christ, but... We know that he's also typifying a message in this movement that is meant to purify us, to remove sin from us, to prepare us to do a work. And Samson, in the end, we know that the taking down of the Temple of Dagon is a type of the Sunday law, right? Most Adventists will tell you that. So, that, so we know that Samson relates to our time. Even if we see him as a type of Christ, he, re he refers to the character of Christ that we are supposed to have, but he's reflecting more the character that we do have, right? Would, would we agree with that, that he's reflecting more human nature. He's re reflecting the fallen sinful human nature that Christ took upon himself, that Christ overcame. So even though he's a type of Christ, he's a type of Christ's humanity, not a type of Christ's divinity, but he still illustrates the same work. And he illustrates it in the application we are making to us at the present time. And I think that this is the primary message that this movement has to grasp if it is going to accomplish the tasks that God has given it to accomplish. As much as we do have numbers and symbols, as much as we do have truths in God's word, those are meaningless if we cannot reflect Christ's character in all that we do. This is the problem. This is the problem that this movement has had from the beginning. And we've had discussions here about some of our experiences within this movement things that haven't gone the way they should have gone. And we're not doing it as ragging on other people who, who have failed. We're looking at this and trying to understand what does this say about us as a movement? Because don't we need to recognize that the sins of the movement are our sins, right? These isn't somebody else's sins. We're not pointing fingers and saying these people are the problem. We're saying... Here is how the movement has acted, and we've inherited this, these problems, and we have to solve them in our own lives. So this Palmoni, this, this angel of the Lord that comes and said, why ask after my name, it is seen, it is secret, I think is a pretty profound point. Now, and if you think about it, 
Why do we ask after God's name? What does the name represent? Character, right? And Manoah here, he's, he's seeking on this level to understand the character of God. He wants to know the name because he wants to understand the character. We don't, we don't have that so much in our society, the connection of our name, but we do have that sense of a reputation. We can talk about his name has been slandered, right? We can say that's the reputation of a person. It's been misrepresented. And God's name has been slandered. His character has been slandered. Um, so asking after God's name, he's wanting to know and understand his character. Then Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously, that's the same basic word as secret, and Manoah and his wife looked on, and it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar, and Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. So there comes a revelation of Christ. What do we call that? Yeah. Whether it's the Mare Mara. It's one of those. It's the looking glass vision, right? It's the vision where we see ourselves in a mirror. We see ourselves in Christ and we see what manner of man we are compared to Christ. When we see ourselves in a mirror, we are undone, right? We die. We fall at his feet as dead. That's the vision that we need. Now, when we are giving a message to the world, Ellen White says we need to give a message in types and symbols. Can Christ be known... By just me telling, you know, let's say we go to somebody and we talk about, well, here's Jesus. He lived here at this pa- in the past and, you know, he died on the cross for your sins. And you get to know some facts about Christ, who he was. Uh, is that how you get to know Christ? Okay. Or you could imagine, you know, what Christ is like. Is, are you going to get? Are you going to imagine him correctly? No. Now Christ is there; he's real, and you can talk to him. But he speaks to us primarily through his word, right? So in nature, he speaks to us, and people can get a sense that there is this this God who created us, and and God Jesus can speak to you directly. I mean, you can commune with him. But the primary way we know him is through his word. Because we could be deceived. We can, we can, our imaginations can deceive us. I know people who believe you know, that they talk to Jesus and all the things that they talk to Jesus about are a bunch of nonsense. And if you try to share God's word, well, Jesus told me differently. I don't accept what the Bible says because I talk to Jesus myself. And we know that they don't know Jesus because Jesus is the one that inspired God's word. He is the word of God, and the word is not going to contradict who he is. <clears throat> so this is um, an important point, this, that we need to know Christ. We need to have that vision. Now, when we look at some of the symbols here, uh, this flame going up, you know, we can think about some of the prophecies in the Bible that deal with that. We can think about the Nashville prediction, and what we expected to happen. But it's some, something in our experience in studying God's word is going to give us this revelation that, this, that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said unto his wife, we shall surely die because we have seen God, right? So if we have seen Christ, we're going to be undone. We're not going to have all this self-confidence in who we are. We're going to have no confidence in self, but confidence in Christ, in who he is. And his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things. Nor would 
as at this time have told us such things as these. When we think about this movement, has God shown us all of these things? Has he told us all these things? Has he told us amazing things, and yet we question whether God is leading us? Right? You haven't been a part of this for a long time there. But God has shown us amazing things. I mean, he's done miracles. And, and he's transformed us in character to some degree, not to what he wants us to be. But he's, he's changed our motives. He's changed our desires. Um, and he's shown us that we were under a self-deception about who we thought we were and how much we thought we know. The one thing we know right now that we didn't know before is we know that we don't know very much because there is so much to know and when you don't know anything, you think you know a lot. You know, when I was six, I knew a lot of stuff. I don't know why they even put me in school. You know, teachers didn't know anything. I knew everything, right? It was partly true, a little bit. They didn't know some things that I knew, and a lot of things they knew were wrong. I could tell they were wrong, you know. But, you know, as you get older and you start to learn things, you start to realize there's a lot more to learn about things than I ever thought there was. You know, music theory. I mean, I've taught music theory for years, and I can tell you that it's a never-ending learning curve to understand music theory. You can go into it in such depths and detail that you could never imagine. And sometimes I get students and they say, yeah, I know music theory. And they may know like how to read the notes and they might know what a scale is, but they don't know how to analyze a Bach fugue, right? And, and even people who analyze Bach fugues continue to analyze and write papers on Bach fugues and notice more and more things that they had never seen before. But in God's word is even greater than that. Right? So there's so much to know. But also, we, there's so much that we don't realize about ourselves. And so by getting to know God, we come to understand ourselves and the people around us and how to minister to them. So there's a lot of things to learn. Now, we, in this present time as a movement, are drawing things line upon line and using numbers and all of these symbols, and somebody looking on. I mean, if somebody walked into Stephen's presentation <laughs> who didn't know anything about what we're doing, they wouldn't know anything about what we're doing with your presentation. Not, not trying to criticize you. It's just that you gave us all this information, and it's a bunch of numbers. They might not even know you're talking about you know, God or anything, right? It's just, what are all these numbers happening? It must be a math class. You know, maybe it's physics, advanced physics. I don't know. But, but you see the point, that there is, there's so much to know, and God has given us these tools, and we don't fully grasp them, but we know they're from God, right? So God's not going to kill us because he accepted our burnt offering and meat offering, and he also has showed us all these things and has told us such things as these. And then we see the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. Now Samson means sunshine. So he must be a nice, bright little boy. You know, very big, happy smile. That's what I think if you have a, a child named Samson. And the child grew and the Lord blessed him. And the spirit of the Lord began to move at him in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. Now, Zora is um, a wasp, right? Or a hornet or something like that, some kind of uh, bee-like insect, correct? And eshtaal, what's eshtaal? Anybody remember? You could look it up. Because I don't know if I wrote it down here. I'm, I'm not sure about my notes here. <clears throat> Entreaty? Entreaty, that's it. 
Oh, yeah. And if we think of entreaty, well, it even says, you know, that um, we, we run into this word entreaty here. Um, but in entreaty, would that be a place of prayer? Or would that be prayer? Would entreaty be considered prayer? It could be. Right. So, so we've taken these symbols and we say that this, this is representing this message and it's moving between the camp of, of, in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol, right? So we have, we have over here the school of the prophets, right? This is in Arkansas. And we have over here Lambert Church. And you have these winding roads that go along here all through to get to Lambert Church from the School of the Prophets. They're probably a little straighter than that. But in between here is Jeff's ministry, Future for America, right? So it's in between these two places and... Uh, you know, sort of off at both the center, it's off at a right angle, roughly, uh, to that, if you drew a straight line on a map. Um, so that's where Jeff lives. And this is where he began his ministry, but they have the Lambert Church, and they have the School of the Prophets that they did. And this is where this message is working and operating, in this, in this location. So I don't know if people... You know, understand that. So the Zora is B, but you got Bumblebee Road. That's where the School of the Prophets is. And then we have this entreaty. So that's a place of prayer. And so this message of Samson has to do with this message uh, that was moving in this, in this location. Now we know that um, you know, this movement begins in 1989, right? So if we go here, we draw a line. Okay. So we know we got this date here, November 9th, 1989. And we're saying that this is the beginning of this message. And so that's where we have to put the birth of Samson. That is, this message of Samson, this story of Samson, covers our whole message of this movement. <clears throat> now, we, we have this oppression, which is the Philistine oppression, that exists before this. Right? So, you know, that would be the period of darkness. So the darkness here, we'll just call it Philistine. The Philistine darkness. <clears throat> um, so I wrote here, this period of 40 years reminds us of the 40 years in the wilderness and is a symbol. We are suggesting that this period of 40 years is analogous to the 40 years from 1989 to 2030. Because when we look at this 40 years, this Philistine oppression is not 40 years before Samson, right? Correct. It's Samson's in this period of 40 years of Philistine oppression. So we're going to say that this 40 years uh, ends on April 5th, 2030, as a symbol, right? Because that's going to be 40 years. Now, it's, it's a bit more than 40 years. This is the end of 1989. This is the beginning of 2030. So it's... It's obviously more than 40 years, <clears throat> but that's where we're going to place it. Now, one way we could count it is we go from November 9th, 1989 to October 19th, 2029, the 10th day of the month on the biblical calendar, a period of 494 months or 14,588 days. So what I'm doing is I'm taking, we can count here, the period of the manna is 40 years as well, Right? So we're going to say that 40 years of the manna, we're going to line up here, and we're going to say that that's this period of 14,588 days, 
494 months, or 2,084 weeks, right? And that would bring us to the first, not the first day, it's going to bring us to the 10th day, right? The 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar, which is going to be October 19th. Uh, 2029. So it's going to bring us to, if this is a jubilee year, the jubilee year is going to start on the 10th day of the seventh month, right? right? Not on the first day of the seventh month. And so we could say, well, this symbolizes the start of a jubilee. That's going to be this last year. Now, again, we're not pointing to this date as an event. We're just pointing to it as symbols. So so the fact that we get the 10th day of the seventh month, when we count from this date, November 9th, 1989, and we take the period of the manna, it brings us to a significant date which would commence the Jewish year 2029 to th that is going to go into the year 2030, right? So that this year here, if we looked at it, we would also have uh, the 10th day of the seventh month is October 8th. in 2023, right? So, so this is a period of a year, a biblical year, and this is going to start that final year. So we can see that it's significant that we came to this date. If we just came to like, you know, the third day of the 10th month, there's lots of dates we could have come to with that count and it wouldn't have been significant. But here we have that count. It's significant. So we're saying that 40 years is this time of Philistine oppression as a symbol. And that Philistine oppression is what we have been experiencing ever since this movement began. And this movement was raised up at the beginning of that Philistine oppression, and um, it's going to begin to deliver God's people. Now, we could do it another way. We could have started on December 31st, or December, December 25th, 1991. That is, we could have counted those nine to 777 days, and we could have said, well, let's go here, December 25th, 1991, and we could count some other way, right? And one way that we could count this is um, if we counted this period um, as an inclusive count, December 25th, 1991, the 14,587 days, so that's one day less, um, but the number of days that manna actually fell, it would bring us to November 9th, 2030. So oh, no, November 9th, 2030 would basically be the same thing, but that would be a little further on. But it would be this 11 9 date in 2030, which would reflect this here, November 9th in 1989. But we'd be starting at the end of the 777 days. So it's just another way to count this 40 years. So 1, 4, 5, 8, 7. That's 14,400 plus 187. And so that's one way, another way to do it. Um, another way is we could count from uh, November 9th, 1989. Let me see. No, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, talk to, okay, I looked at that one. Oh, we could count from the center of the 777 days, ending December 25th. And that would bring us to November 9th, 2030. So I did that one wrong. I think we could just take the 40 years. Okay. So this one actually doesn't start here. It starts at the center of this. That's why. So it starts here in the center. Okay. So that's better. That makes more sense. But anyway. Um, we have different ways in which we could count this. Which one is the best one? I don't know. Now, if we look at it as a symbol of the wilderness, we can equate the 40 with the 1260. In our history, we have 126 shekels from 1863 to 1989. Then we can um, safely mark 1989 as the time of the end with the arrival of the first message. And we can connect this to Christ coming to the wife, the church, and Manoah, meaning rest, because Manoah is just another form of the name Noah, in uh, 
verse 13, verse 3 to 5, or chapter 13, verse 3 to 5. There's 1335 there. It is here that Samson is called through his mother to be set apart as a Nazarite. We place the increase of knowledge in the first seven, seven day period, ending December 25th, 1991. It is here the message is formalized with the official fall of the USSR, and this is shown in chapter 13, verse 6 to 10, where the woman shares the message with her husband, and he seeks to know how to raise the child. So this is the increase of knowledge. The empowerment of this message is 9-11. This is seen in verses 11 to 17, where Manoah communes with the angel of the Lord, Christ himself. So that's going to be the first message. So we can say that the first message arrives in 1989. It's formalized here. So we're just going to say, we'll do it this way. We'll get rid of this. Just. <clears throat> and so we're going to have December 25th, 1991. And so that's 777 days there. That's an inclusive count. And that's going to be just the first angel arrives and then the first angel is formalized. <clears throat> and then this message is going to be empowered at 9-11. Right? So the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down here too as well. And so you're going to have 9-11. So 9-11 is the first angel is empowered. And then we're going to have the second angel arrive. <clears throat> now, we're, we're actually moving quite a bit further down here with this second message arrives. And we placed it at June 22, 2014 with the revelation of Ezra 7-9, that is the Palmoni. So the reason we chose this as the second angel arriving because on June 22nd, 2014, we have Noel presenting Ezra 7-9, right? And this opens up a message, an aspect of our message that is hinted at in this first message, but it definitely expands since that time. We can agree with that. I hope we can. In 1318, it is the answer to Manoah's question in regard to his name, why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret, that is, wonderful. This is a reference to Palmoni, the wonderful number. This message then relates to the symbolic use of time, especially in connection with symbolic dates. So here, with Ezra 7-9, we get this the first day of the fifth month. And this now becomes a way that we can look at dates in the Bible symbolically and it opens up all kinds of light to this movement. <clears throat> the formalization of this message is then in connection with the presentations on the structure of prophetic chronology which I presented beginning in September 11th, 2017. Now, when I put this date here, I also do take 2014 to include the presentations that I did on chronology that summer in, um, in Alberta and also in the fall in Arkansas. So I'm, I'm sort of including all of that here, 2014, as the arrival. But I'm saying that the formalization has to do with putting this, the time that we actually get this message and all of this light on chronology to the movement is going to be starting on September 11th, uh, 2017. That's going to be the formalization of the message. So here I'm at the School of the Prophets, and I, you'll go from September 11th to 22nd. And then we know, of course, I'm going to present... July 18 on September um, 23rd, 2017. So that, that's all part of that formalization. <clears throat> so 
So I could place the formalization at either of those places, uh, but that's where I place it. And, and this is symbolized in the offering of 319, where the angel in accepting the offering does wonderfully. We place the empowerment of this message at 11.9, beginning the period of 777 days, 30 years after the period of 777 days that commenced November 9th, 1989. So what I'm doing here is I'm just saying we have from here, from September 23rd, we're going to have November 9th. So this is going to be the second angel empowered, November 9th, uh, 2019. And that's going to be this 777 days here between these two dates. Okay, so, so November 9th. Now, November 9th, we also introduce the Mayan calendar to the movement in an official way. Um, and then we're going to have the third angel's message arrive here, December 25th, 2021. And that's, again, 777 seven, seven days. So in this line, we have these different periods of 777 days attached as spans to, to these way marks. Now, somebody may argue about which events we choose in particular. Maybe there's some arbitrariness to that. Um, but these are the way marks that exist in this message. <clears throat> so I've, I've drawn those out. Um, and the interesting thing, too, um, that we have also is in this one, I, I put here April 5th. Um, 2030, but we actually have the fourth angel arrive not here on the spring, but we're going to have it arrive on July 18th, 2030. So you'll, you'll see why in a moment. So we're going to put here July 18, 2030. Now July 18 is a symbolic date again. We're not predicting anything on that date, but we're going to say that this is the fourth angel arriving. And that has to do with some of the symbolism that is here. So the first thing is we have the name Manoah. It means rest. And the Hebrew number for that, the Strong's number, is 4495. Now, if we uh, square that number, it's 20,205,025. It has a 2020 followed by a 525. Also, if we were to take that as hours, it would be 187 days and 7 hours. Right? So the name of Manoah gives us this 187 plus the number 7. The sum of his name is 52. The product is 21840. If we took those as hours, it would be 910 days which equals 910 is 13 times 70. So we had some of this analysis. But the one that was the most interesting that led us to this conclusion is that 4495 minus 777 is 3,718. And that is a symbol of July 18th, 2030. So we're saying that Manoah points us to July 18th, 2030, and that period of time, if we count to July 18th, 2030, this is a period of time from here to here that is 40 years and 252 days, right? So because of that, we see these symbols and this analysis, and we say, well, this, this obviously is not likely, and so we're going to take this as the date that's being pointed to there. Now, again, it's not an event. It's just a symbol. And if we go from the end of the 777 days and we count the period of time to July 18, 2030, it's 14,085 days, which is 2817 times 5. So it's the, we can take that number, divide it by 5 by the wise virgins, or the foolish virgins even, just the five, 
and it gives us a symbol for July 1822, the iteration of the numbers 2817, right? <clears throat> and yeah, so this 2817 is those four digits that we have for, you know, 1872. Um, one it's just another arrangement of them. <clears throat> so um, now we have another uh, a thing about the Hebrew number. Um, it means, so if you took look at uh, the Hebrew uh, number for the word, and I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing here. So there's a number. Um, the number of hours is 178 days. So 187 days, that's what it is. 187 days is how many hours? So it's 4488. And if you look up the word 4488, it's the word manna. Not the manna you eat, uh, but the manna, the manna, you know, the money, the manna, right? Okay, money, money, manna. That's what it is. And it's the verse, we, we looked at it today in Ezekiel. Right? 45, 12. And the shekel should be 20 giras, 20 shekels, 5 and 20 shekels, 15 shekels shall be your manna. Right? And that's the Hebrew number 4488. So is that significant that you can take 187 days? So, and the reason I recognize that is if you take the seven hours off that 4495 for Manoah, you get this word 4488, which is manna, right? And the gematria of Manoah yields a sum of 52. That can refer to May 2nd or the 52 days for building the walls in Nehemiah, which applies to our lines. And the product of his name, as we looked at, is this yields, you know, 910 days if we put it into hours. <clears throat> now, when we look at Samson's death, the fourth message arriving is a repeat of history. Right? That's how we understand the fourth angel arriving. And here we have placed this at July 18, 2030. This comes from the symbol of the Hebrew number for Manoah, right? So if we subtract 77, seven, it yields 3718. And if we count from November 9th. So I've gone through that. But this is a repeat of history in our time. Now, um, I also put on here, on this page, just another chart um, which doesn't relate to this story in any direct way. Um, so this relates to another story. So that chart of the first day of the first month we're kind of uh, going to look at in some other study. I just put it there because I had space. But if we look at Samson, we can see that it represents his birth, represents this movement through its whole history. But we're now in the midst of this history at the end. We're in 2023, and we have these symbolic dates in the future, and we have to figure out how we relate to them. And I wish I had the answer. That is, I wish I could tell you exactly what's coming in the future and what we need to do. But we need to examine that for ourselves. We have this light, and this light is, is definitely light, but it's not something where we can look to man to give us the answer. This is where we have to seek God. We have to figure out what it is that God wants us to do individually. And we know that it always starts with a work of repentance, confession, and entering into the work of Christ, cooperating with him. So, um, finishing a little bit early, which isn't too bad. Um, but we're going to look at, uh, tomorrow we will look at Samson again at 5.45 p.m. So, but what we're going to look at after this study was we're going to go into the week of Christ study. So we're going to take, take a break and then go into that study. So can you join me in a word of prayer? Mm. 
Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have this opportunity to, to study these things. We are in awe that you have given us this light because we definitely are undeserving of it. We are not the most skilled. We're not the most um, experienced. Uh, we are not the most charismatic. We're not the most um, accomplished. We're not the most gifted. But you have given us a gift. And we pray, Lord, that we can use this gift wisely, that you can teach us how we are to handle the child, how we are to raise it, how are we to take care of this message. We know that um, our lives are not the way they should be. But we know you love us and you are calling us and that what you are offering to us is better than what we have. And so we pray for those searching for truth that they can know that you love them and they can know that you are working in their lives. And we ask, Lord, that you can teach us. Thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.